Welcome to Mindset for Success, a We Global Studios podcast. We explore the psychological challenges that many successful women entrepreneurs face while building their businesses and how they have overcome them. I'm your host, Dr. Leslie Knutson, and I'm very excited to welcome to today's show, Liz Owens. Liz, um, I'm going to give an introduction, which is just an impressive introduction to you. Um, Dr. Elizabeth Owen is the founder, chief data scientist of Learning Data Discovery, LLC. Her work centers on optimizing data-driven design of immersive learning systems through integrated machine learning. Recently, she was a data science consultant at Google and headed adapted, adaptive game-based learning systems as director of learning data science at Age of Learning. Prior experience includes data science at Glass Labs, EA Games, the U.S. Department of Education, and the NSF. Welcome, Liz. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> Lots of impressive stuff there. Well, thank um, you. So if you would share with our audience a bit um, about your growing up. A little bit. So um, I've been in data and um, games for the last 10 years and education for the last 20. Um, Mm -hmm. Before that, you know, I actually grew up, ironically, not thinking I was good at math. Until I until I was in high school, hard sort of um, hard to believe, but okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it speaks to I, I think that there there, yeah, I think there is a lot of sort of implicit bias um, less now because there's more awareness around mm-hmm. it. But in terms of STEM and girls, I think that was very real, um, mm-hmm. and girls weren't being reached in the way that they needed to be reached. Um, so that I think that was part of it. Um, but anyway, I, yeah, I, I grew up, um, in kind of a, a suburb of Los Angeles and, um, loved art and, mm-hmm. um, and performing arts and, uh, which has served me well through my, through my whole, right. <laughs> whole life, I think. Right. Uh, and, and yeah, I, and I, you know, I, I hated school until I was, maybe in eighth grade. And then I learned to kind of get better at it and play the game. So there's a mm-hmm. sense of like, okay, well, these are the rules of the game. If I want to have my independence and go to college, I need to, you know, go to college, you know, where, where I would like to go. Mm-hmm. Um, I need to under- understand what the rules are and game the system in a sense for my own, my own, progress forward, not in a manipulative way, but to, to say, okay, here are the rules. Here's, I'm going to most efficiently move through this, um, to have an end goal of, of personal freedom in a Mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. So I think Mm -hmm. in eighth grade, that's kind of when it started to kick in. Um, my brother was very instrumental in that. So my brother is 21 years older Mm -hmm. than I am, uh, same parents. So Mm -hmm. I was a, I was a surprise. Mm-hmm. For sure. 21 <laughs> years later. Yes. <laughs> Surprise. Here's exactly. a little baby girl. Um, exactly. So my brother was, you know, <laughs> I say grown up. He acts like an eight year old boy still around me. But mm-hmm. um, he, you know, he, he had done a lot in his education and, and um, personal life. And so he encouraged me to learn about college and, you know, and, and understand kind of what, what the situation was mm-hmm, with college mm-hmm. and how you get there. And, you know, and, and so he really helped a lot with that. So once I understood that, I said, uh, yeah, I want to get away from my parents and go to college. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's it a wasn't normal progression. Yeah. I mean, it's, I wanted independence uh, and freedom. So mm-hmm. I just, I learned how to I figured it out. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I was involved in a lot of activities too. I think that really helped ground mm-hmm. me. I was in, I, it, it's kind of ridiculous. I was taking on a lot from an early age. Mm-hmm. Um, 
so all that activity helped to ground me in a different way. Um, mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. I was in, a, in high school. I was so I guess at one point in eighth grade, I was in a <laughs> taking piano lessons, voice mm-hmm. lessons. I was on swim team. I was playing mm-hmm. on the soccer team, and I was in dance. And this was <laughs> all because you wanted to do it, or your parents said we'd like you to do um, all these. You know, I think I sampled a few things earlier, but all of that was me wanting to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think partly was to get out of the house. Um, mm-hmm. It wasn't the most harmonious atmosphere. Uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my parents, they're they are both really loving and, and great. I don't think, I think they, they come from a different generation where mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It, they were born in 1935. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so okay. you know it, working through yeah so it, it wasn't the most harmonious atmosphere so I think part of it is I just wanted to do my own thing and develop myself and be out of the house um mm-hmm. some and, and you always felt capable of being out of the house it sounds like I did you know my parents did a really good job of making me feel really confident you know they were they were very they I always knew they believed in me mm-hmm. you know I always knew that they believed and my mom she was the first person in her family to graduate from college. Hmm. Um, and she always said, and she graduated from college, basically raising my brother um, and going to college at the same time. Hmm. Uh, yeah. And my dad was in another state for that period mm-hmm. of time. So she did it all mm-hmm. um, for the, through pure determination. Um, and she just said to me, you, you can do whatever you set your mind to. Mm-hmm. And she always said that she always, so said she that. was kind of your first role model, female yeah. role model. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah my mom mm-hmm. is, a, is amazing. Um, mm-hmm. she's, yeah, she's very, very determined. And, um, when she decides something that's, that's the way it is, <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> there's, there's no waffling, uh, after mm-hmm. a decision that's made. It's just, that's it. Um, yeah, she's very different than I am in many ways, but mm-hmm. she's, you know, she she really modeled for me kind of determination and and strength in that sense. Um, mm-hmm. She's also mm-hmm. more like she's also yeah she's also a, a, a more typical Southern woman in the sense that she's very social. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really sweet. She's um, an amazing hostess. You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. for sure. Um, didn't necessarily inherit all of those qualities but she uh you know she's she's, but she promoted you being able to be independent yes and she always worked so she Mm -hmm. was um she was actually brought in most of the income um Mm -hmm. in our house Mm -hmm. she was a teacher Mm -hmm. and then later worked um in the public schools as a school counselor after getting a, a second degree there like a um a certification mm-hmm. and so yeah I always saw my mom working and you know having her kind of live that out like I, I'm doing I'm doing it you know mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. so that was really amazing to, to watch and so she really was my first role model that way mm-hmm. um anyway I was in, involved in a lot of activities and that was helpful because I think draw and and you know my sorry going back to the confidence thing I think um <clears throat> my dad is mm-hmm a very smart individual, really smart guy and mm-hmm. really talented too. And, um, he really, he really always instilled in me that, um, that I, that I was, you know, capable of whatever I wanted to do mm-hmm. and that, um, you know, instilled a lot of confidence and in intellectual abilities, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. which mm-hmm. he's very intellectual and, um, analytical and, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. very curious he has this childlike curiosity about mm-hmm. about learning about things all the time mm-hmm. um which is yeah. a bit like you yeah I think so I mean I'm thankful I'm thankful that he modeled that because mm-hmm. it did rub off mm-hmm. <laughs> and also mm-hmm. you know I also learned from him you know he's a bit of an iconoclast it's uh mm-hmm. it, don't accept things at face value you know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. always ask why. And he always issued group mentality. I mean, he never, he had few friends, but the friends he did have were good, you know, lifelong. Mm-hmm. Friends. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So not having a pack mentality, I guess. And, um, questioning having loyal them. friends. Yeah. Having loyal friends. Yeah. And so, you know, I was very lucky to have parents 
like that who were so supportive and um you you know. when our in our pre-interview you spoke that in high school sometimes you felt different from others mm -hmm. um would you mind telling us a little bit about that and actually more importantly how you made it work for you mm -hmm. Which I think is yeah, really interesting. Yeah, I actually I remember feeling different from other people as early as preschool. Mm -hmm. Like um, socialization was never easy for me. Mm -hmm. I, even though I had been in daycare from a pretty early age, mm -hmm. um, just I, f I felt like it was harder to relate to people, or maybe it was a self consciousness that mm -hmm. I um, had learned. You know, my dad kind of has some of that where. Mm -hmm not he doesn't feel socially confident all the time mm -hmm. um and that's hard for him I think so mm -hmm. I may have been absorbed some of that um and as you know just my <laughs> as somebody who is extremely sensitive and absorbs almost everything from everyone else mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. it took me a long time to learn to put down boundaries Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. do not take on what other people had and think it was mine. So mm -hmm. it's one thing to, under, to, to sort of sense what other people are going through and, and, and what their emotional state is. Mm -hmm. It's another to just absorb it and not understand that that's not your stuff. It's someone else's. Right. It took me right. a long time to like sort that out. Um, I think even in my, it took me until my late twenties to really mm -hmm. understand mm -hmm. that. And mm -hmm. so as a result, I was kind of, yeah, I think um, after high school, I think I was kind of drifting, mm -hmm. um, and the way the wind blew would blow, would would you know push me one way, and then I would go the other way because I was so I was just taking in everything around me and um, you know kind of responding to that as my own, mm -hmm. and, and I um, knew but at the same time there was a sense of grounding too and, and confidence, but. Anyway, that was something I had to learn. Um, so I think part of that difficulty of being in large social groups or around a lot of other people is I actually would absorb other people's, um, you know, emotional mm -hmm. state mm -hmm. so easily. And I, I didn't know how to separate that mm -hmm. from how I felt. Mm -hmm. So I think that was stressful um, mm -hmm. in a and way confusing. that... I, and yes. confusing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, you know, and then I felt sort of lonely I think because I just felt I felt different I felt like I you know <laughs> I was really naive mm -hmm. um, and I'm kind of a very earnest person mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't deception is not something that's really part of my makeup I don't know mm -hmm. if it's really part of anyone's makeup I, I have a theory that that's really just a learned behavior but mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. I didn't really, that wasn't inherent. <laughs> Street smarts mm -hmm. weren't an inherent part of my mm -hmm. <laughs> makeup. Right. So I think that made me gullible and, you know, it, uh, here and there, not all, not consistently, but here and there bullies would kind of, uh, you know, have that be a tempting uh, ground for them to mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. push them around. And then I would take that for a little while and then I would try to figure out how to get rid of it. And, you know, that was, that was interesting. But I never consistently felt bullied. It was it was here and there, though. Um, and I just I just felt really different. I didn't feel like I had the same street smarts as people. I I was kind of dreaming. I kind of had my head in the clouds, and mm -hmm. I loved to paint and draw and sing. And I would just actually in elementary school, I would sit in the back of the class and mm -hmm. read mm -hmm. because I didn't feel it was relevant to me what the teacher was teaching. Wow. wow. <laughs> so in elementary school, a teacher would say, "Okay, memorize these math facts." Um, mm -hmm. and I didn't feel that I needed to, because I didn't understand the reason that I would do that. Like mm -hmm. why? So I can take a test and you can grade mm -hmm. me on it. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't feel, I don't understand why this is relevant to my life or anything else. Um, and I'm not interested. So I'm going to sit in the back of the class and read. And that's mm -hmm. literally what I did. Mm -hmm. Um, so something different was driving you than yes. maybe people your own age than what was, yeah. I mean, not in a dramatic way, but you were being driven by something else. I, felt, I always and, felt that, yeah. And what 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 do you think that something else? Um, how did it drive you to go into, if it did drive you to go into, data science and be creative in terms of making uh, games? Um, 
I think that I, uh, you know, I think I think all children are creative to some degree. I think it's a natural state just having my mm-hmm. own children and seeing them and, you know, child development courses and all that. But I, I really think that my own experience with children has really made me understand that. Um, but I, I felt like I, um, I had things that I wanted to create, mm-hmm. things that I wanted to create from pretty early age. Mm-hmm. And nothing else was really that interesting besides creating those things. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I, I guess I could... I guess you could say I was kind of driven by um, the need to create and to to make things that were, you know, kind of new and different. And um, Mm -hmm. I wasn't really happy unless I was doing that or unless I was reading. I like to choose your own adventure. Uh, I also love The Hobbit. (laughs) So that that really, I think that stuck with me. And um, once I learned like, oh, here's the way that the system works. And I guess I'm going to have to engage with it if I want to have personal freedom. And when that Mm -hmm. clicked in in eighth grade, then I became an A student. Mm -hmm. Um, Because I then I understood why it was relevant. Um, Mm -hmm. I I really wasn't one to try to gain approval for the sake of approval. I just Mm -hmm. I just didn't care. Mm-hmm. Um, not that I was rebellious exactly. I just didn't, it didn't seem relevant. Didn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> no, it just didn't. So I think that drove me and, um, you know, I went, I went into education for a long time. I was a teacher for 10 years after mm-hmm. college. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't feel like that's exactly what I was supposed to be doing, but I liked it. I was good at teaching and I liked the idea of helping people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, ultimately that like the overwhelmingness of being in a, in a room of, of people and, and managing that all day, I think was really tough mm-hmm. just from having hypersensitivity around that. But mm-hmm. I, I was, you know, I was good at what I did. It just never quite felt right. And then, uh, then I learned that I was looking around, like, I think I need to do something else. I like education a lot. Um, but maybe I need to be involved in it in a different way. Um, it also struck me just from my classroom experiences. I, I um, was a, a founding teacher at uh, the Los Angeles Academy of Arts and Enterprise, which is a charter school um, in Los Angeles starting in 2005, and it's still there. Um, so that was cool to be part of that. I, I was a um, grade six through eight, or yeah, six through eight teacher. The school went through high school. Um, and um, I think there I I really got to see that number one data is so important. Assessment is the tail that wags the dog. So assessment is deeply important because it's the way that uh, teachers will respond to the way they're being assessed. So if everything is based around test scores and the, the teacher's job and the school funding depends on this, you know, once a year decontextualized multiple choice tests (laughs) that at the time was very, um, and what what do you think having it where does a having a convic- conviction come from um is it the sense of responsibility which drives your results being true to you yeah i i really um i really think authenticity is is deeply important um mm-hmm. as much as i've you know in my life felt pressured to be what other people wanted um and I did feel that way for a long time until like mid mid to late twenties when I realized like I don't really feel that my life is going in the right direction. I want to take some control of this. What do I mm-hmm. want to do while not being authentic? Um, and mm-hmm. that was also you know going to graduate school and then going into the corporate sector and um, working for others was very informative um, and it was a great experience. I learned a lot about business and I learned a lot about you know the way business relationships function and, and, you know, more importantly, producing things like educational games, Mm -hmm. um, and getting things done too, not just Mm -hmm. the dynamics. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm deeply grateful for that. One thing I also realized there's, you know, a business is just an idea. It's an Mm -hmm. idea that, that someone has had and has launched and other people have agreed to give their time and energy to in exchange for, compensation and money, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and finally I thought, well, 
I never felt quite happy where I was. I, I, you know, I was treated really well at Age of Learning. I had an amazing experience at EA Games, um, which those are two places I had worked after graduate school. Um, I did end up getting a PhD in digital media in the School of mm -hmm. Education with an emphasis on uh, learning analytics and data mining. Um, mm -hmm. focused on simulations and games so that we can drive personalized, engaged learning mm -hmm. um, across demographics, you know, at a distance, which is mm -hmm. very powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, it can be very powerful to, to drive positive change. Um, so that's that's what I ended up focusing on. But, you know, my, my lessons in, in, in the corporate world were very valuable. And I walked away just understanding, you know, I have ideas too. Mm -hmm. And I have things that I'd like to move forward Um also my frankness and, and kind of need to be authentic at all times. Um, mm -hmm, sometimes mm -hmm. didn't sit well with, <laughs> right. you know, your kindergarten ability. teacher when you were in the back reading your books. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And, yeah, yeah. uh, that became more apparent to me, like, okay, I think we might be in that situation again here. Um, I love that these people, I love what they're doing, but I feel like it's, you know, it's time for me to choose my own adventure. Mm -hmm, you know. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I chose it and I started a consulting business, um, just kind of took a risk. You know, it, it always, it always comes with risk, but it feel, if it feels like that's the authentic thing um, to do, I have no problem doing it. I think taking risks out of fear or a sense of fear or lack is always a bad idea. But if, if, right. if there's a sense of deep conviction and, and direction and, and something about that move, that movement forward is really exciting and inspiring. Mm -hmm, it mm -hmm, feels like it's mm -hmm. drawing you that, right. that leap should be taken, um, as mm -hmm. scary as it was. <laughs> exactly. I was starting, I was also had, you know, I was also pregnant at the time that I left, but, uh, it, it didn't matter. That's, that's what was the right thing to do. So I think, um, I learned to trust my gut. You know, I, mm -hmm. that's one of the most valuable lessons I've learned mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. the last 40 years. You trust your gut, you know, right. um, and it took a long time because there's people try to tell people want you to feel the way they feel, or they want you to, you know, follow the rules or do the thing that, that they want you to do. And, it, you know, I, I, I think I was somewhat passive, you know, growing up and I didn't want to make waves and, mm -hmm. um, but I also couldn't just do that. So right. I think at this point, it was my way of saying, I, I'm taking control of this. I'm trusting myself. And I had actually undergone a lot of healing. So mm -hmm. when you do give yourself permission mm -hmm. to move forward and, and have sovereignty in your own life and decide what you, you really do want to do, mm -hmm. there's a certain mm -hmm. amount of dues that need to be paid in terms of expertise or whatever to, to get to that point and make that jump. So there's that mm -hmm. reality, but it's also, um, self-permission giving right. yourself permission is so important. And part mm -hmm. of that is healing, right. healing, you know, right. there's a lot yeah. of voices left over from childhood, you know, mm -hmm. um, unfortunately a lot of the negative ones stick, you know, mm -hmm. there's, there were a lot of positive messages in childhood too, but the negative ones tend to stick. Like, right. who are you to do this? You're not good at math. You're, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You have to play by the rules. Who are you to be sovereign when nobody else is sovereign? And right. sovereign is a strong word, but it's like, you know, who are you to be independent and, and mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. your own trail when everybody else has to fall into line? And, and it's just like, well, this is what I'm choosing to do. And I can. Right. And, and a lot right. of that is just a myth. A lot of that stuff is just, it's just programming. And it's, it's, it's just not true. Right, <laughs> right, right. And Absolutely. so, moving, yeah, and moving through that and healing, that was a really important thing. Um. Liz, we've, uh, we're, believe it or not, we're out of time, but I thank you so much for coming on today and talking to our listeners about your motivation and what you've done to overcome some of the psychological issues that obviously come up for people starting new business. Um, where can people reach you to learn more about your work? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I'm on LinkedIn with v.elizabeth Owen is mm -hmm. my name on LinkedIn and um, my email is similar v.elizabeth.owen at gmail. Those are my main points of contact. And in, in the consulting business, I've worked with what I do in the consulting um, world is, is I work with engaging platforms um, like games and simulations and learning platforms to uh, support data driven design mm -hmm. for better engagement um, and better, better user growth. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I'm a data scientist, I'm a learning scientist, and I'm a game-based learning designer. Um, so I work at the intersections of big, a lot of those. Big, big mouthful. Lots of impressive stuff. Thank you. And also hopefully soon to be a start a startup founder as well. I'm, I'm launching a, a games company um, coming up pretty soon. So that's exciting. Stay tuned. Very. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Thanks so much. You're welcome. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Leslie. This podcast is brought to you by We Global Studios, the first startup innovation studio and digital DIY startup platform for women entrepreneurs around the world. For more information on our guests, this podcast, and many other female founder programs, please visit weglobalstudios.com. I'm your host, Dr. Leslie Knudsen. Please drop me a line at mindsetforsuccess at weglobalstudios.com. See you next week.